Good morning, Prakaptan. Glad you are here, and I hope you're well. Next week, you can expect a continuation of our conversation about fate, choice, and determinism versus compatibilism when I sit down with Chris Gill. I won't spoil that conversation for you, but you can rest assured that the ancient Stoics were smart enough to consider what a will without choice would mean in their philosophy. For the meantime, however, a respite from the heavier meta discussion that has been consuming this podcast and the Discord community for the last week, and also an announcement. Ross and I know the gender of our baby. We found out the other day. And if you're a member of the Discord community, you know it too. But if you're not, you don't. And unfortunately, I can't tell you because Ross's mom listens to this podcast and we have a special way we're going to tell her. So if you're listening, Momsy, you better not join the Discord or you're going to spoil the surprise. You and Popsy are going to have to wait. Today we will be covering Enchiridion 9, but first, there are a few new patrons to thank this week. So let's thank them. They are responsible for this being my full-time job. And they are responsible for you being able to listen for free if you can't afford to support my work directly. So when I say let's thank them, I am truly intending to use that contraction. Let us thank them. Jim Dawson, thank you. Greg Stote, thank you. Haley Shurgan, thank you. Trisha Hold, thank you. Carlos Canales, which I hope I've said correctly, thank you. Clifford Clewer, which again I hope I've said correctly, thank you. Y'all are the bee's knees, the cat's pajamas, the caterpillar's kimono, the tiger's spots, and the bullfrog's beard. Yes, I had to Google all those. All that to say, you're lovely, and I appreciate your support. And now it's time for some ads. Don't like them? Then become a patron. Don't like them and can't become a patron? Then take solace in the fact that your free listenership supports me anyway because of these ads. And that's a win, win, win. And who doesn't like a three-way win? By the way, Don't forget about that lifetime ad-free deal that I'm currently offering for the holidays. Just one purchase equals no ads for the rest of eternity, or at least the eternity of this podcast, which I hope is eternity. Anyway, check the show notes for more information on that. Here come the ads. I have used a lot of commerce platforms in the past. By far, the most robust is Shopify. No matter how complex your business needs and no matter how large your business grows, Shopify can handle it. And they do handle it for brands like Rothy's, Ruggable, Allbirds, Knox, Magnolia, Brooklinen, Glossier, and Cotton, to name a few. You may already use another e-commerce platform and you may be super unhappy with it, but you've already put a lot of work into it and migrating to Shopify could seem impossible. But I'm here to tell you that it is quite easy. When I migrated to Shopify back in 2022, their apps and tools meant I just had to make a few clicks and everything was ported over as if by magic. Shopify also lets you design your storefront however you like, which from personal experience I know isn't the case for many other commerce platforms out there. All these features and all this control can result in more sales more often. So stop leaving sales on the table, switch your business to Shopify today, and discover why millions trust Shopify as their all-in-one commerce platform to build, grow, and run their businesses. Sign up today for your $1 per month trial at shopify.com forward slash practical, all lowercase. That's one month for just $1 at shopify.com forward slash practical, shopify.com forward slash practical. It's 2024, and I'd like you to kick off this somewhat arbitrary divide between past and future the right way, with a clear and focused mind that's prepared to take on the next 12 months. And so would my sponsor, Neurohacker. I have struggled with attention issues my whole life, and I've tried a lot of remedies to help me to overcome those struggles. Some didn't work, others had side effects, and others were too expensive or demanded an unrealistic amount of my time. Then, in 2022, I found Neurohacker's Qualia Mind Supplement. Qualia Mind is a nootropic that combines 28 of the most research-backed nootropic ingredients on Earth into the ultimate brain fuel formula, Qualia Mind. And it's been changing people's lives now for years, including my own. The formula is non-GMO, gluten-free, even vegan, and all its ingredients work in concert to assist your brain in achieving focus and clarity. It's also backed by a 100-day money-back guarantee, which I doubt you'll need, but is always a nice thing to have just in case. If you struggle with attention or focus issues, or if you'd just like a boost in these areas, see what the best brain fuel formula on earth can do for you. Go to neurohacker.com forward slash practical for up to $100 off Qualia Mind. And as a listener of Practical, 
Practical Stoicism, use the code PRACTICAL for an extra 15% off at checkout. That's neurohacker.com forward slash practical and use the code PRACTICAL for an extra 15% off to experience life-changing mental performance from Qualia Mind. Today we're going to be diving into Enchiridion 9, one that very ironically, and I promise that this is not intentional, dives into the freedom of choice. Don't worry though, I won't come on too strong in this episode, we can save that for our Gill conversation, and for the third guest in the series, who I will announce soon. Here's Enchiridion 9. Sickness is a hindrance to the body, but not to your ability to choose, unless that is your choice. Lameness is a hindrance to the leg, but not to your ability to choose. Say this to yourself with regard to everything that happens. Then you will see such obstacles as hindrances to something else, but not to yourself. Seeing that this advice is coming from the ex-slave who had his leg broken by the bare hands of his so-called slave master, I think we ought to listen to this man when he tells us that it's what we choose and not what happens to us that matters or that really matters. You're sick? Okay, well, what does that mean other than you're physically ill? Does being sick make you a liar? No. Do your circumstances make you a liar? No. Do circumstances make you become anything you don't choose to become? I don't know. Let's think about that for the rest of this episode. Part of what makes us us is our experiences. Another part is our own inherited nature. Let's look at our experiences first. When I experience an event, be that event preferred or dispreferred, it might be easy to think that that event has shaped me. But I would argue that that's wrong. If I'm robbed, and then I'm afraid of being robbed for the rest of my life, was it that event that made me afraid? Or was it my illogical mind assenting to a false belief that once robbed, always at the risk of being robbed again? and so I should be afraid. But what about psychological trauma? Well, if I'm being honest, I'm beginning to believe less and less in psychological trauma, at least in the way that we talk about it. I'm beginning to see psychological trauma more like illogical choice that goes uncorrected for such a long time that it becomes a chronic condition, an embedded behavior that becomes all the more difficult to overcome. This is a statement I'm sure will get me shouted down quite a bit, but someone I know was in a serious car accident some many years ago. They came so near to death, in fact, that we were all certain it was a sure thing. I remember hearing, through other people in our shared networks, that this individual was so traumatized by the accident that for many years they couldn't travel in a car during wintry weather, since those are the conditions under which the accident happened. In that case, or any case like it, Isn't there some sort of assent going on at the decision-making level? Aren't we first assenting to the idea that almost dying is bad, then to the idea that being afraid of death is therefore logical, and then finally to the idea that traveling in a car in wintry weather carries with it a high probability of death, and that this is categorically bad? Isn't it all a series of judgments that get frozen in our minds as sure things, as facts of reality? and that we then have to spend a lifetime thawing out to overcome? So is it the car accident, the near-death experience, the dispreferred events that happen to us that change us? Or is it really our choices all the way? Sure, events have influence, primarily because they are the nexuses at which we are prompted and given the opportunity to choose. But if person A can get in a car accident and not be traumatized, while person B can get into the exact same car accident and is traumatized, isn't this kind of like what makes a thing evil or good? A good thing must always be good, or else it's not good. That's virtue. An evil thing must always be evil, or else it's not truly evil. That's vice. So why not, in order for something to be traumatizing, it must always be traumatizing, or else that something isn't actually traumatizing? Don't we traumatize ourselves by assenting to impressions, solidifying them into beliefs, and becoming incapable of justly interpreting reality in a kind of chronic fashion? And I have no doubt that some of you are screaming at the idea that we traumatize ourselves, but how could it be any other way? 
And that's a genuine question. I'm not saying I'm right. I'm asking that question. I'm presenting this idea. I'm giving you food for thought. Our experiences give us the opportunity to choose to develop our character in one of millions of directions. But they don't hinder us. Only our choices can do that. There was this video game, and I know that seems like a strange tangent. In fact, it will seem even stranger since I never played this video game, so I'm probably going to mess up the synopsis of it, but I believe it was called Fable. Again, I never played it, so I'm not going to try to explain it, but I'm mentioning it specifically because of a trailer I saw for it many, many years ago. The trailer presented a concept that I think at the time was one that hadn't been presented in a video game before. When your character in this game made choices, their appearance would change. And if you made good choices, you would get more attractive, though I don't mean beautiful in this case. And if you made bad ones, you'd get more ugly. I don't think the terms beautiful or ugly were used in the trailer, but it was insinuated that good choices made you look more good and bad choices made you look more bad. This resonated with me at the time. I don't know why, but I remember thinking it was interesting to suggest that you'd look good if you acted good and you'd look bad if you acted bad. Of course, in practice, this is silly, right? That was a video game. Plenty of ugly looking dudes have hearts of gold. And the opposite is, of course, also true. But the concept stuck with me nonetheless, so much so that it's the first thing I thought of when I read Angiridion 9. When we rob some old woman of her purse, if we were to do that, it's not the taking of a purse from someone's hands that makes the person doing the taking ugly, for this is just the moving of an object through space and time. Instead, it is the choice that we made to act unjustly, this is why the Stoics would tell us that if we stole a purse, or only decided to steal a purse, but couldn't find the opportunity to actually steal it successfully, that we would have made the same moral error, the only real error we could make, an error in judgment, and that we would have made it in both cases. We were equally unjust, equally immoral in both cases, whether we were successful in stealing the purse or unsuccessful. We chose to believe that taking something from someone was logical, just, and appropriate. This is something like the stork's nest in the capital, which we've talked about before. Okay, so what about our circumstances? What if we need that money to feed ourselves? And so we believe we justify stealing the old woman's purse because we know she's financially wealthy, in this example we know, and she won't miss the purse or the money inside it much. Did our circumstances make us choose to steal? No. Our poor reasoning led us to our choice to steal, didn't it? We first believed that starving to death worked against our attainment of virtue, the only good, which is wrong. Then we reasoned that stealing was okay because the person we were stealing from wouldn't miss what we were stealing. That was also wrong. Then we chose to steal. And of course, that was wrong too. The irony is, we might have acted virtuously if we just starved to death which is why I think most people struggle with this concept. How can death be better than living? And that anyone would ask that question proves that they're struggling with the idea of virtue and stoicism. Death isn't better than living, and neither is living better than death. The only good in stoicism is virtue. You know that by now. And so the one thing we must never corrupt is the appropriateness of our choice. If we choose theft over death, we'll survive as a vicious person. If we choose death over theft, we'll die in a final act of appropriateness, which is approaching virtue, which is more important than living in Stoicism. It's never the experience. It's never the circumstance. It is always the choice, at least in my opinion. The rest is either an excuse or a logical explanation, but it's never a hindrance or a reason. Thanks for listening today. I hope you enjoyed this episode and that you're not too upset at me for shouting down the idea of psychological trauma. But if you are, you can join the Discord to let me know. That's at stoicismpod.com forward slash Discord. Thanks again for listening. And until next time, take care. Take care.